Mike and Deb are up here. I know you guys for four years, and I just, I appreciate Mike and Deb. They're real. They're genuine. What you see is what you get type of people. And I remember hearing Mike say one time, this is why you're up here, Mike. I, I didn't tell you this. I but thought you, it was about the, how much money I spend eating out. Yes, yeah. Deb, Never look at that report. It's Deb awful. can tell you that, can't you? I, they're up here because I heard Mike tell me, he's like, Deb is incredible with money, and she can tell you how much gas we spent in our Honda Accord in 2003. Because she has that. And I heard that because I was like, wow, there, there's somebody who is really anal. tracking, well, anal, or really tracking, <laughs> let's go with tracking, um, really tracking you know, budget and money and all those things. And, and to see your heart and your passion is to we want to master our budget, master our money so we can leverage it for the greatest cause that we can. And, and I see that in your lives. And so we're up here and you guys are, are budget tours, right? So, so you're the spender. I am the spender. And you're the, you're the saver or the budgeter, right? And, and in your marriage, you had to figure out how to make that work. But talk me through before Jesus. You guys were married. You had Sammy. You're, you're living life, right? You hadn't gotten saved yet. You hadn't really wrapped your head around what God's calling us to do with our lives and how to live. And, and you guys mentioned real quick that there was a, something on your fridge that you would put up there on the, on the refrigerator. What was that? Sure. So we, uh, we loved, I loved to spend um, all of our money, and uh, when I was in control of our money uh, before Jesus, we were frequently bouncing checks all over the place, uh, all over the place, and then paying those fees as well um, because I wasn't handling the money well. I had a very difficult time saying no to Deb. Had a very difficult time saying no to me, uh, mostly me. Right, so. Deb would say, can we afford that? Because she definitely is a saver. I'm like, yeah, sure, right? Because we had credit cards. We could absolutely afford that, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so on the fridge was we had actually made a list of things that we wanted, right? A full list of uh, I want a uh, color TV, right? I want a new guitar or whatever those things were. To be honest, I don't even remember what those things were. That's lovely. Um, but we had lists with our names beside them and how much they were going to be. And these weren't great things like, hey, a new roof or, you know, a new living room floor. These were trivial wants sort of thing. Anything to add to that? So, so you get saved. And how did that change your view of money? Like when you recognize you want to live for a cause greater than yourself, you recognize what Jesus did to, to provide forgiveness for our sins and what it means to follow him and all of a sudden your world kind of went from material to the spiritual right and and deb i think you mentioned you stopped doing something about that time in your home you we we got rid of our television yeah and what did you notice so in that process of getting rid of television recentering your heart and and that list on the fridge how did those three things kind of work together so one by not watching television all the time and that and that's it was advertisements. And we have different sources of advertisements today than just our television. But you, didn't, you weren't constantly bombarded with this new cool thing or that, and you should have this, or you should have that. There's so many messages. So we didn't have that bombarding us, but we also gained a perspective of the kingdom value and what really matters. And it started to become obvious that stuff was just nonsense. You know, if you collect all these things and you have it in your house, well, it's just one more thing to collect dust and to have to clean around and have to protect. And it's, it's just burdensome. So, so now you're... Up. I, I would also say we are grateful that um, as we first came to Christ, we were in a church that um, talked about money. Right, they were very open and honest. They would take uh, the first Sunday in February, in January, in January um, every year and talk like we're talking now. Um, but they would do it every single year, just have an open, frank conversation about money. So very early in our walk, we got to hear about what should we be doing with our money? What priorities should we be making with our money? Sure, and so now married, and understand who Jesus is and both having the same, you're, you're running towards the same goal. Now a budget helps you guys communicate. Because Deb, you know if Mike has $20 in his wallet, it's he, gone. Sp he spends it, right? <laughs> but he's not fighting you for money. You guys are actually using your budget to be able to communicate 
and to know where you're going to be and when you're going to get there, and, right? And so talk to us about the freedom a budget has brought to, to your marriage and to your, your home. Well, so the budget, um, the freedom is I, a peace of mind uh, because I, I know exactly what is coming in and I know exactly what's going out. And uh, Dale had mentioned this when I do the budget. The first thing I put in is God's portion so that when Sunday comes around, I don't even have to think about it. I don't have to worry about it. I know that it's there. And um, That's first fruits. Yeah, first fruits. Well, and the first fruits thing really is, I. so it's the 10% tithe is how we do it. And I look at it from our pre-tax dollars. That's the first fruits portion. I don't base it off of after Uncle Sam. God, God gets it first. Um, but yeah, it's a huge peace of mind. And um, I am uh, a little bit on the anal side about <laughs> making sure I have everything in. And I do use an application. For me, I use Quicken. And so it is kind of a written budget because it's all in there. And I have everything pre-recorded. So like everything that comes out on a regular basis and eating out money, that's in there too. And I actually have it so that it pre-fills 90 days out because what I spend today doesn't just impact today, it impacts further out. And um, another cool thing about budgeting is um, even for what we do put on a credit card, I see every dollar that's going out and where it's going out so that if we kind of get a little lazy and lackadaisical and we're maybe a really hard week at work and we're tired and Mike's like, oh, can't we just go out to eat? And I go, yeah, let's do it. And then Thursday rolls around, oh, can't we just go out to eat? I'm so tired, yeah. Well, when you get back and you look at your plan, you can go, oh my goodness, <laughs> we ate out three times this week and we were only supposed to eat out once. You can course adjust because we are going to have bad weeks and we're going to make bad decisions, but because you're watching it regularly, you can catch it before it becomes uh, damaging. And there's a lot of peace in that. Okay. And there's the freedom also of release of guilt. So let's say I want a new base, right? We can budget for that base, we can save for that base, and when I get it, I don't have to feel guilty that we put the family in danger to purchase it, right? So it doesn't mean you don't get, right, like Dale said, it doesn't mean that you all of a sudden have to live like a pauper. It means you live with a plan. And maybe the plan involves some fun things as well, but then when you get them, you don't have to live in the state of guilt of, oh, look, I, my kids don't get to wear shoes because I have this cool TV. Right, right, the freedom, and, and it gives your marriage the ability to be on the same page, can, you know, be able to talk about things, but also know this is why we're committed to this budget. This is why we're committed. Let me read this, this passage to you, because, Mike, I know this is, this is your heart. This is something that we've talked about before, and uh, worship band's going to come up, so uh, worship band, you can come up, but Malachi, this is Old Testament, and we're living in New Testament, but Old Testament teaching the principles of giving and offering and tithe system. Back then, it was very, very, very strict, even like your spices and your, your crops and your animals and your gold and all those types of things were clearly talked about. But God is talking through his prophet Malachi. He said, will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you. This is Israel. Israel was under a curse at that time because the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And th this is the interesting thing. Maybe you haven't realized it before. God actually says, Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. We're called to test God. That doesn't sound like a good thing, right? You're supposed to trust God, believe God. Don't test God. And God says, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I mean, it's an incredible thing where God's saying, when you recognize me, honor me, right? He's not asking for all of it. And in fact, my 10% is different than your 10% is different than their 10%, right? And 10% of a dollar is 10 cents. Yeah, and 10% is important. 
when we first decided to start tithing, we had made that decision, then I lost my job, right? 9-11 had happened right at that point. I was in an industry that was severely affected by that, and I got laid off. I completely lost my job, and I did not get a job for three years, right? So I went back to college, and so our income went down to just Deb's income was coming in. I was just a big fat expense um, in the house, even more so. Um, so, but that 10%, the beauty of that is we had significantly less money coming out, but we were able to still give the 10% because we were planning it. It was just a much smaller amount. So God never says, I need everyone to give $200 at a time, right? He says, give 10%. So if you only make $90, you only have to give nine. Right? It's, it's nice that And way. what do you do with the other 81? Whatever I want to do with it. Right? No, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but still, that's how it kind of, the yeah, idea, that, that God's not saying you have to give me everything all the time. And a lot of times that's how church and money is wrapped, is that it's greedy, it's being embezzled, it's being drawn out. But really it's this idea of giving to God first and saying, I trust you so much that I'm going to give you 10% or whatever that number is. Um, I'm going to give that to you, right? And, and I'm going to trust that the rest is enough for me to get by and see that happen. Well, you need to get your base on. Deb, do you have any other things to close with? Well, I was just going to share because I know we had talked before and you mentioned that concept. I, I've, I've heard it a lot where you save off uh, three months of your salary is your, your Emergency saving fund. buffer. Yeah. And hallelujah to anybody out there who's actually achieved that. Um, I don't know how you do it. Um, and I don't know, maybe God was identifying an idol in my heart of safety and control and money rather than him. But anytime we are able to save any amount of money, something always happens. And the money is gone. Uh, so I don't want you to think that we have a big load in our bank because um, we don't. But God has always met us. And, we, and our plan definitely helps us save enough that when stuff happens, we're always taken care of. He has never been not faithful. He's always provided.